Wolfgang's going to be a very hard act to follow. So I'm just going to fill the time between now and when Andy gets to come. So, uh, so I come from an environment where it's really hard to give an uninterrupted talk because people will um, chip in with questions, usually good, awkward questions. So feel free to chip in with questions, particularly not good, awkward questions. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about so just one, a, a few issues that we come up, we run into in our work inside Google at managing the cluster of machines on which the stuff that you and I get to use externally runs. Um, like the first talk is just a, the first half is just an introduction to the way we think about things, and the second is uh, some examples of some problems for which we wish we had better answers. Hopefully you guys can help us come up with better answers, which is why I'm giving this talk. So, uh, Omega is the name of our next generation cluster management system, Precise makes a cute logo. So, we have a fleet of machines, the precise number I'm going to be a touch vague about, but I think a few hundred thousand of them, scattered across a number of different data centers. You can find this information available publicly externally. Those data centers typically are close to our customers. We want low latency because uh, customers value low latency, they click faster if you give them results quicker. Uh, as a result, there aren't many of them in Africa yet. I thought that has come with time. Inside those data centers are machines. Uh, but actually, before we get there, <coughs> one of those data centers. This one happens to be in Finland, which is one of our recent ones. It is the first seawater cooled data center that we put together. It's an old uh, printing plant that we've actually repurposed. This is the inside of one. It doesn't happen to be the same one. This one's in Lithia Springs uh, in the US. This is the prettiest it's ever going to be. <laughs> because somebody's going to come in and fix the machine, or change it, or add disk trays, or replace one of the racks, or something like that. But it was great. We let a photographer in to take photographs of it before it got used. <laughs> but this is really nice. So it's regular, it's repeatable, it's simple to understand, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, here we to the same place from outside. If you can quickly, you can guesstimate roughly how many machines are in there. So not going to be that too long. <laughs> Those machines, as you saw, are arranged into racks. Uh, the, 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 the machines are actually just single trays. We design them ourselves. We get them built for us in, uh, in China and Taiwan. Um, so the machines are over here on the left. They get fitted into racks. A rack is, for us, uh, a group of machines, confusingly not necessarily a physical group of machines, but it's connected together by a top rack switch. Think about 80 machines in a rack. Uh, a, a machine can either be a single board or sometimes we'll have extra boards with disk trays inside them. Um, those racks are connected together via a high speed cross structured network. Think terabits per second. So, terminology a cluster for us is just a set of machines with one of those high speed networks joining them all together. Typically, a building will have a cluster in it. Sometimes this cluster will span a couple of buildings on the same site. Occasionally, one building will have a couple of clusters inside it. So, you know, all possible combinations occur in the profile. That's hardware. The software, which is what I get involved in, uh, <coughs> those clusters up into one or more cells. Often, there is, each cluster will have a cell associated with it. The cell is run by a centralized manager. We need it to be full tolerant. We have five copies of that centralized manager, one of which is active at the time, the other which are off standbys. We use uh, shared state, we use pack source replication to keep stuff consistent. So if one of them falls over, we can let the new master and just pick up where they're not and carry on. And every single machine in our world, they're all running Linux, they run a little local agent which talks to that master and responds to requests for, for it to do work and reports on status and stuff like that. So help to calibrate the size of one of these things, a cell, a medium-sized cell as of May 2011 was 12,500 machines. We have bigger ones. <laughs> so, great. That, that's, that's cute. Um, if you're an internal user, what do you do with this stuff? Well, you submit jobs to these clusters. Say, I would like you to run this job, please. You have to say clean, otherwise it doesn't work. <laughs> um, sometimes you have to bow three times to the east to get the stuff to do the right thing. Um, and you submit your, your jobs to this manager. A job is just a set of one or more tasks. A task in the Linux process group that runs on one machine. What, when I say one or more, it could be one to several thousand tasks are a single job. Pretty much all the, the tasks are all the same, so they're just replicas of one another. And the job of the manager is to say, great, where should I put those? Which tasks run where? It gets to do a few, other, a few other things as well, which we'll talk about that in a minute. So what else comes with a, a, a description of a job? Well, there's a number of tasks inside it, great. 
um, there are constraints. We'll talk more about that in a second. You also say things like, this job is more important than her job. Um, much more important than her job. This one makes money. Um, you can imagine there's a priority system, and uh, the high priority jobs get to bump out the low priority jobs. Unlike some other people, we actually do live preemptions. Uh, you can specify whether it's a batch job, which should finish, or a service job, which should never finish, or stay up continuously. So Gmail is an example of a service job. Right? The requests that come into it are RPCs from the front end web servers. Uh, they get responded to in a few milliseconds, and then the next one comes in. Uh, they shouldn't finish. They will stay up continuously. We don't start a new job for each uh, Gmail. We just keep that running for sometimes weeks at a time. Batch jobs can and hopefully will exit successfully. The median execution time for a batch shot task was 37 seconds, and it's getting shorter. That's a problem, because it turns out that the way we do binaries inside mm -hmm. Google is we build, we do stack of linking. So you shit, the joke is, your hello world is about three gigabytes. <laughs> <laughs> so of that 37 seconds, the majority of it is moving binaries around. We're, we're working on that. But. OK, great. So I talked about packing. This is basically just a bin packing problem. A multi-dimensional constrained bin packing problem, but that's basically what it is. So it's a oh, nap packing problem constraint. So here's a machine that's got I think, two dimensions, because two is easier to draw. There are more. Uh, you can imagine disk space, sort of network bandwidth, and a bunch of other things like that. Um, ground, uh, sorry, a flash, flash capacity. Uh, and the goal is to end up with as few stranded resources as possible. You don't want to use up all the CPU and then have memory left over. You don't want to use, use up all the memory and have CPU left over. So you want to sort of use them both up simultaneously and end up with the least amount of unnecessary wasted at the top. So I mentioned constraints. Constraints are things like, I want to run on a x86 architecture. Well, you can specify that, but it's pointless. They're all x86 architectures. Right? Uh, nonetheless, people do, uh, because in the past they weren't. Uh, and in the future they might not be, who knows? Um, you can also specify things like, no more than two of my tasks should be on the same machine. Right? Because we've been we, we ask for a tenth of a core, and we've got a ten core machine, and we can put a hundred of your tasks on there. Cool. You might not want that. You can also say things like, I don't want to run with that job, because this job and that job interfere in a bad way. They have collisions at the cache layer. You can say things like, no more than ten of my tasks can be on the same rack because you want to be able to cope with failures. We'll come back to that in a minute. Failures to now dominate a bunch of stuff. So there's a pile of constraints you can add. Um, we've discovered that in practice, the constraints roughly double the time it takes us to do the scheduling. <coughs> you can take some advantage of it because you can sort of throw out machines that don't fit, but then the more complicated constraints like the rack placement ones are turn out to be harder to, to, to do calculations with. Okay, great. So if that was all it is, I wouldn't have much else to talk about because this is fairly straightforward stuff. Um, but to help you understand sort of what happens inside these systems, I should say we run multiple tasks on each machine, and we don't dedicate particular machines to particular kinds of work. So the same machine will be running Google Docs, which is what this thing is, and also doing MapReduce applications simultaneously. A typical machine runs between 10 and 40 tasks at a time. And that's going to get worse as we add more cores. And uh, but here are three, three clusters, lovingly named A, B, and C. Uh, internally, they have two letter names, but never mind. Uh, cluster C is the one for which I published a trace of all of the scheduling events, the job scheduling events, not the process of scheduling events, uh, for 29 days in May 2011. I'll give you a point in a minute. Uh, so that's a 12,500 machine cluster. And we have two other ones, one which is big and one which isn't. So the way to read these bars is, uh, the, the dark solid color is the batch work, and the stippled color is the service jobs, long running service jobs. So on the left hand side, the far left bar here, that tells you that 99 something percent of all of the jobs that get submitted are batch jobs. No surprise. Uh, look, looks like 75 percent of all the CPU is consumed by service jobs. So the usual rule of thumb is all jobs are batch jobs, and all resources are consumed by service jobs. That's a good first approximation. Uh, the difference between different cells, there are some differences. We use slightly different uh, different cells run different kinds of work. Um, but across this set, this is a fairly typical. The distribution is roughly like this, or most of them. Okay, great. 
Uh, so this is that trace I mentioned. If you search for that stuff, you can find the pointer to this trace. Uh, so you can play this game yourself. You can download this trace and send it back for the gigabytes, uh, compress, and you can try doing some scheduling experiments. If you do, let me know how you get on. We'd love to see, see if you can do better than we did. Uh, so you'll see we didn't do particularly well in a few areas <coughs> for various reasons. Uh, so the kind of data in there is every when every job arrives, we have a record. When every task is placed, we have a record. When every task is evicted, we have a record. When every machine dies, we have a record. And every five minutes for every task, we tell you how much its average CPU and memory utilization was together with the peak over the last five minutes. So you can do some interesting stuff with that. And a few people have done some analyses and begin to do scheduling experiments. That's why we release this. Okay, great. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about sort of some of the issues of the system and we'll think about some of the issues that come up in addition to the scheduling stuff. The scheduling stuff is not the only thing in the world. Sorry about the top. Okay, great. So the first thing to notice is you know, I've talked about scheduling stuff, but I haven't talked about storing things. Our goal is to make the world information accessible and usable, meaning you have to have a place to put it. So where do we put it? We put it on this drive like everybody else. Um, and some flash. In the future, I guess that 99% of the accesses will be to flash and 99% of the data will live on disk. <laughs> that tells you you don't actually access most of the information in the world, which is good. You can use that. So every, every machine has disks, and you can write a local disk, and that's fine, as long as you don't expect it to survive very long. So the standard mechanism is to write it locally and then copy it as fast as you can to somewhere that will survive. So local disk is volatile because any machine or any disk can break at any time. And they do. So what you do, you put it into a persistent storage system, which basically makes copies of things. I have to use the application, which is the old one, GFS, and we've actually just turned that off, so we now have a new one, the CFS, Colossus, where we use erasure coding to place stuff. So the idea here is that any single disk drive failure won't matter. Any single machine failure won't matter. In fact, we lose a couple of, of disks, uh, and your data will not get lost. On top of that, we layer things like Bigtable, and then there's about five or six other ones. The nice fun thing about Google is that there's always three ways to do anything. One of which is deprecating, and two new ones that don't work yet. <laughs> uh, so we have uh, storage guys are victims of this as well, so there's a whole bunch of different storage systems laid on top of stuff, but they all pretty much base themselves on top of the uh, these, And these are resilient to provide all sorts of things. People do heroic efforts to recover data after a cluster goes down. Okay, great. Uh, scale. Just touch on scale a little bit. When I worked at HP, just before I left, I worked on a petabyte scale storage system. Well, we were immensely proud of that fact that this was big. And then I got to Google and discovered that it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so scale is kind of fun because it pushes into the domains which you otherwise wouldn't reach. And when you, when people did get a page because their system was a to run out of free space. You don't have to go back there. <laughs> No, it's kind of fun. You can crank things up. You can tell big stories. Uh, I was having a conversation with my office mates the other day, and it was sort of somebody said, well, if we did that, you know, blah, 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 it would save about 50 petabytes. And then we looked at each other, and one of us said, is that a lot? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, but what's, what, my point of view, what's interesting about scale is the things it gets you into, which is stuff goes wrong. One of these things goes wrong, it's an irritant. When you have uh, 100,000 machines, and you will discover that when things go wrong, even very rarely, you're living in the tail all the time because stuff is happening. So here's some sample data from my friend Luis Barroso about how often stuff happens. It's a lot. 1% doesn't sound much. Now scale it up. You've got an application which runs on a couple of thousand machines, which would be a medium size installation of Google Calendar. And there's a few of these things scattered across the globe. You're going to see 10 failures a day. This is normal. We have to write software to handle this stuff. This is not draft, it's failed, let me go do something about it. No, no, this is, we have to write software to handle the failure, which makes it interesting. When at HP, this petabyte scale storage system, we had design discussions around how we make it fast enough to be interesting to our customers, and you know, we're storage guys, we know how to make stuff resilient, we can do that. When I get to Google, nobody bothers about speed. We make speed, yeah, sure, we can do speed. We have very bright people with really good algorithms, we can just listen to more machines than that is. But the design questions are the form, what happens when that fails while you're recovering from that and you've lost network connectivity? Those are what the design discussions are about. It's about failure cases, not about performance. Performance we can add. Failure, if we don't want to inject more than necessary, we have to look at the code. So each of these things are 
actually relatively benign, they affect a single machine. Those aren't the ones that keep me up at night. These are the ones that keep me up at night. The ones that are correlated failures across multiple <laughs> machines, or they take out a few terabits of networking. If you lose access to a, a site because the entire power has gone down, or because somebody has shot out one of the network connectors with drunken hunters in the western states of America, which I'm trying not to name, particularly got people Or here's a shark, a picture of a shark trying to munch on an underwood cable. <laughs> It's a fiber. So why is it munching on fiber? It turns out you need 25,000 volts to power the fiber repeaters. So they, they hum a little bit. <laughs> Sharp, sensitive to electromagnetic fields. Uh, why do dogs like the insulate, like the, the lubricant you put in cables to pull them through conduits so they will pick them up and chew on them? Uh, people in Eastern Europe think that fibers are worth ripping out because they can sell them for copper. <laughs> and my favorite is in South America, we discovered the hard way that the size of the pit or the depth of the pit you need to bury a dead horse is less <coughs> than the depth which you normally bury cable back. <laughs> okay. uh, but these, the problem with these things is they take out a bunch of stuff simultaneously and that's much harder to handle. So, for example, we will keep copies of things in separate data centers because we have to assume that any one data center can go down. Some, some apps cope with having two data centers go down, so n plus two for redundancy at the entire sort of application level. That's what we need. Okay, great. So, so going back to our, to our theme here, cluster management includes handling things like failure. So software breaks all the time. It's amazing how bad people are writing software. So if it's a service, we'll restart it for you. If it exits, that was crazy, come back up again, we'll restart it. If it uses more memory than it should have done, maybe we'll kill it and then bring it back up again. Sometimes people ask me, how do you migrate stuff from one machine to another? We don't use virtual memory, sorry, virtualization technology, we use virtual memory. We don't use virtualization technology very much because it costs a few percent of overhead. At this scale, a few percent of overhead is another data center. Or a few hundred million dollars here, a few hundred million dollars there, and you're talking about real amounts of money. But, but we, we have apps that can handle failures. So how do you move something from here to here? You take it over there and kill it, and then you bring it back over here. It can't tell the difference as to why it got killed. It just knows that it died. Maybe it was some high priority thing needed that space. Maybe we decided we needed to shuffle it to move some space. Maybe the machine died. It doesn't really matter to the app. It has to handle that anyway. So that gives us some flexibility and freedoms you wouldn't otherwise get. And we don't have to pay the price of virtual machines when we get it. There are a few places where we use them. You'll see we offer a competitor to Amazon, so those things run on VMs for real. And there's another couple of cases like doing Chrome testing for Windows, you want to run on VM to be able to try stuff out. Okay, so as cluster management system designers, our goals are to run every single piece of work that our customers give us. Yeah, right. Um, they, they're very good at inventing new, new work. Um, we tolerate all the failures that happen. That's hard, but we do our best. Yeah, we help people cope with it. They have to do stuff as well. Uh, we would like to provide predictable behavior. Right? If you're running business, you want to make sure that if your system is running today, it's going to run tomorrow. And if you're running businesses like the ones we run, you have to worry about what happens if you have 25% growth per quarter, and will it still fit uh, next year in the, in the place where it is? <coughs> if it's not, how are you going to find a place for it to go and grow? Uh, and you know, these, these things are expensive. When I joined Google a few years ago, uh, somebody just sort of woken up to the idea that we spent how much on machines? Can't we use them a bit more heavily? Uh, <laughs> things are, you know, machines are cheap compared to people, but not at this scale. Uh, we can spend quite a lot of money on, on this thing. So how can we increase utilization to, to get the system going? And then finally, we do this, people actually run it, are extremely small in number. Think tens of thousands of machines per person. Not two or three machines per person, like you can see in that. Now, part of it is it's easier because they run much the same kind of thing, but part of it is an heck of a lot of automation. And we try to provide support for those people as well. Okay, great. Is it working? If you're not measuring it, the answer is almost certainly no. <coughs> so we spend a few percent of our resources on monitoring the rest of it. We've discovered that's worth it. Um, <coughs> that helps us understand going on in a distributed environment, you have to be able to do things like, you know, I've got 400 instances of this, uh, which one is behaving weirdly? 
Um, turns out by focusing on things like uh, tail latency, living in the tail may be one of the themes of this talk. Focusing on tail latencies, you get the main line stuff to work right. If you don't focus on tail latencies, somebody's going to get hurt, and they're not going to like that experience because it's going to force them to go somewhere else. One, we want to click away from the competitors. Um, but this means you have to have enough data samples to be able to ask realistic statistical questions about the 99 percentiles. And we actually care more about 99.5 these days. This is all slowly pushing our way up. If you talk to Amazon, they will actually only measure the 99.9 percentile. For the Dynamo paper a few years ago at SOSP, they had to put special code in to measure the averages. Because they never bothered. <laughs> right? If you care about the table, then everything else follows. So, this turns out that you know, monitoring is well worth investing in. And remember, monitoring systems have to scale. They're touching these hundreds of thousands of machines running 10 to 50 tasks apiece. And they're running on, guess what, the same machines. Which means when things are going pear shaped, the monitoring system is also subject to the same kind of errors that you're trying to cope with and understand. So that makes it more fun. <laughs> okay, great. So you notice I didn't list power or energy. Is that we don't care? No. We care a lot. Uh, but by far the best way to save energy is to write better software. Don't take 5% improvements on various other things by playing games without well, talking about the cooling in a second. Make your software five times faster. That's the way to save energy. Algorithmic fixes are far more effective than almost anything else you can do, especially if you're a couple of them. Uh, occasionally people say, you know, they get wildly excited saying, I'd love to do some research on, uh, can't I turn some machines off you know, to save energy? First question, why did you buy them in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> Second question is, well, where do you think the storage system runs? If you turn them off, you lose access to the data unless you do heroic just group jumping exercises. You can, but not clear it's worth it. Um, and we'll have your last one. So it's not terribly smart to turn machines off. Why don't you do something? You bought them, right? Why don't you do something useful with them instead? There's plenty of computations out there that would be great to have. <coughs> All those cat videos need to be transcoded. <laughs> um, and we also bend over backwards to make sure our data centers are as efficient as possible. So this is the graph of the power usage effective of PUE, which is the total power coming into a site divided by the power consumed by the computers. So if it's bigger than one, it means you're spending a lot of energy on cooling, lighting, keeping your sysadmins uh, warm and happy. Um, in theory, in fact, it's possible to get less than one if you can find a way to recycle the heat that comes out of these things. But it turns out our data centers tend to be in the middle of nowhere. <coughs> near cheap power and, uh, and cheap water. So that's not so good. Uh, a few years ago, the industry average for PUE was about two. So 50% of the energy was being spent on non computer stuff. That's bad. But going back to my theme from earlier, we're now down to about 10 to 11% of our energy is being spent on stuff like cooling. It's actually pretty good. But it means if you want to get a massive improvement in efficiency, you've got 10 to 11% to play with. Whereas if you write a new algorithm, you can get a factor of 10. Uh, so this is data from the, uh, the, second, the first half of 2013, so it's up to date. It's getting better. We're still trying to improve. Um, and here's how we do it. Passive water cooling. You take hot water and you put it down these things so it a little bit evaporates. Uh, and the other stuff that doesn't evaporate ends up cold at the bottom, which is great. Uh, and tubes. The internet really is a set of tubes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is a cooling system for that little spring cycle of the pretty much as I showed you earlier. Uh, so we have people who do this stuff as well as the guys who write software. It's kind of fun and every time, the, every time the data center guys talk about what they do, they always have a picture of something being dynamited. It's just traditional. I don't know why, but we're talking to that mode now. Uh, the other thing we care about is green energy, and we try very hard to do the right thing here. In fact, we've been carbon neutral since 2007. We just bought the 240 megawatt output of a new wind farm in Texas uh, in September. So we're trying to get completely green energy sources for everything we can. We're working on it, it's getting better. So you know, one of the things we'd like to try and do is encourage other people to think about these things as well. Right? This planet is worth saving, let me say. Um, the other thing, but by the way, by running in things like very efficient data centers on this kind of power, that's a much better way of doing computations than doing things on your desktop. 
or in a, 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 a silver farm with 20 machines in it. Right? This is way more efficient than that. So we're actually helping people by by doing by centralizing these things and running them very efficiently. Okay, great. So all this, you know, the stuff that we know and love and use from our company runs on the previous generation of customer management system, uh, which I shall not name, but it's named that on um, that was built before I joined the company, and it actually worked really well. It's a problem if you want to build one better. The first one is really good. Um, however, it has some issues. In particular, it started out as a prototype running sort of 500 to 1,000 machines at a time, and it has experienced what software engineers lovingly call organic growth. <laughs> which means it's a rat's nest of knitting internally, which has two problems. One is that means we can't add features to it because we don't understand what break. And the second is we can't add people to the team because we can't get them to understand the system. <laughs> so it's really hard to bring people up to speed. And we have internal customers who keep on saying, I want this. I want this now because I'm about to do that to you. And if you don't help me with this, it's going to really hurt. So we'd like to have something which is more flexible. We'd like to have something which is more predictable. The current system lives only in the present. You ask it to do something now, and it really can't tell you about what's going to happen in a few months. It has no clue. The concept doesn't exist. So guess what we did? We built a brand new system. And those of you who are familiar with Fred Brooks and the mythical man month will understand the dangers of the second system situation, and we have experienced all of their joys and glories. <laughs> Let's not go down that path. Uh, so the main goal we're offering our users is better predictability, um, and the main thing we wanted for ourselves was better ability to make changes in a hurry. Uh, so we can add features quickly. So how does it work? So this is uh, designed for Omega. Uh, at the bottom of the machines, the agents have been rechristened omelets. Um, in the center is a distributed Paxos-based implementation of here's the state of the cell. Which, here's the machines. Here's how busy they are. Here's what they're running. Here's what their future looks like. It includes a calendar of the future. So we can actually talk about will that machine be up tomorrow or not because I've decided what great firmware on it for the operating system. And above that is a set of verticals. So the verticals they go that way, up this way in this picture. Uh, some of them are schedulers, these guys. So we have a scheduler which runs service computations, right? If you're going to run something for six weeks, it's worth spending a minute or two working out where best to place it. I'll give you a couple of reasons in a minute. On the other hand, we also have a scheduler which is dedicated to batch jobs, right? There's a lot of people who submit a batch job or want an answer now, or interactive batch. Clever placement and minimize the chance of failures is irrelevant. Find a place running. Next. So those two algorithms turn out to be wildly different. And the previous system glommed them all together and tried to use one piece of code for both of them. That was one reason why I ended up with this spaghetti-like interior. Uh, deciding when to do an operating system upgrade, which takes a machine down for 30 seconds or so, is, guess what, a scheduling problem. When should you do it? You want to find the least disruptive time to do it. And then you want to tell people that. That's what goes in cell state. So the results can say, you know, it's getting rebooted at noon, and I've got a job which will last four hours, I can finish it before then. Let me get the restarted. That's worth doing. I'm so that's what Omega is. Um, we tried to bring failures up to the first class property, and we published a paper in Eurosys last year, this year, uh, talking about comparing <coughs> that optimistic concurrency model. So the way it works is each scheduler has a copy of cell state locally in its memory. It makes a change, and it tries to push it back down to cell state. And if the world has not changed under its feet, it succeeds. If it has changed, it gets told harder, repeat. Okay, so you can imagine the quick ones are easy because you don't get conflicts while stuff is happening. The long-running scheduling decisions could experience a lot of delays and conflicts because other people are changing things on their feet. So we were interested in how bad can you go, and the answer is if you do things the right way, you could reasonably expect to spend 60 seconds on scheduling and service jobs and still have the thing keep running nicely. This graph here is just to say, here's the old system. Uh, so blue is good, red is bad, because these jobs didn't get done. Up means more uh, time spent busy inside the scheduler, and the axes represent how often things are arriving, uh, and how much time it takes you to deal with them. Uh, so this was the previous system, which is mostly OK, except for this gap at the bottom, because it's got a single threading in the scheduling process, so you get stuck behind something. You have to wait a while. This is our intellectual competitor, Mesos, all red or bad, <laughs> uh, which is our stuff in blue or good. <coughs> Great. I love this kind of talk. Um, so here's, here's just a trivial example of the kind of flexibility we wanted to inject. Right? So we have people who run MapReduce jobs, quite a lot of MapReduce jobs. 
it turns out. This is a sample of, I think, one day is worth of MapReduce jobs across the entire fleet. And this is the number of tasks you find in each MapReduce job. See the clear, uniform distribution of job sizes where the system is correctly picking exactly the appropriate number of tasks in order to get the job done in a particular way. Of, they all end in zero. Hmm. Um, 11 is a little bit, never mind. Uh, 200, 100, 800, it actually goes off beyond that, but never mind. Um, what's happening is people are going, yeah, double it. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, good, leave it alone. Don't change it, move on to something else. And so people are just, you know, rice rat numbers are really good for people. Are these the optimal task sizes? Hmm. Guess what? No. Um, what happens though if we had a, a scheduler that understood that these were MapReduce jobs? Now, the nice thing about MapReduce jobs is you can do models. <coughs> if I've got my, uh, a map only job, I can increase performance by having more parallelism, assuming you have know, enough data sources. Uh, so I can say, I can have linear prediction of, 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 sort of uh, progress versus number of workers. Cool. What happens if I'm in a cell that is temporarily not very busy? I have to run them faster. So we wrote a simulation. Interns did this, uh, and this is what came out. So one of the laxes is how much faster does it go, and this is no faster at all. This is bad. Notice there isn't anything bad. Um, vertical axis is what fraction of the MapReduce jobs that we saw in uh, a real life system could we have sped up? It's a simulation, so probably won't be quite as good as this, but never mind. So the first thing to notice is the bottom thirty percent, no difference at all. Progress doesn't help. We probably bottlenecked on some kind of orange juices or something like that. Or but 60% of MapReduce jobs can go faster if you have spare resources. A lot faster. We're not talking 3%, we're talking a factor of 3. Hmm. Because the machines were just sitting there. Remember, we didn't want to turn them off because that was silly. This is the kind of thing you could do with those, quote, idle machines that are running your storage system. They have spare computational cycles. Let's take advantage of this. Why do we have idle machines? What I'm going to do now is switch gears and talk more about things we don't know how to do. This is the kind of stuff I would hope people like you would be interested in trying to think about. If you come up with answers, grab me afterwards. We'd love to talk. <laughs> now, here's why we have idle machines. This is the externally visible load imposed on Google US in terms of web traffic uh, for a week or random week in 2011. It goes up and it goes down. So we have to provision for those peaks. In fact, we have to provision for way higher than those peaks for when you get a weird, unusual event. Remember when Michael Jackson died? We thought that was a denial of service attack. I <laughs> think <laughs> <laughs> what happens when he dies again? <laughs> so we provision for those things. But by far the best way to deal with denial of service attacks is to serve them. Because then the bad guys don't know what they know. But that means you have spare capacity in the nights, which is these periods here. Now, it's not going to go to zero. People are still doing weird stuff at two in the morning. Who yeah. knows? Um, what we can do is we can try to fill that in with batch stuff. Right? This is the front end user facing things that have to have low response times. But the batch stuff can typically wait minutes or hours. Overnight is often really good for log analysis, for example. Yeah. So we try to move stuff into those troughs, which is why we have lots of idle machines overnight, which is why we can make things go faster. But what you want to do is to get the same performance for your end users at the peaks and the troughs. That's why we provision the peaks. They shouldn't know that it's late enough. Here's another issue. I told you we have a calendar. It means we have projection for the future. Cool. Great. You can make promises. But it raises some issues, right? I now have to ask the question, will this task fit on this machine? So imagine that blue task here. Um, resources, like memory or something like that. Doesn't it? Great. If you ask the question now, you can say, does it fit now? Cool. Great. Now suppose that task runs for six weeks. The question is not, does it fit now? But will it fit for the remainder of those six weeks as well? <coughs> so you have to look at every time that timeline where somebody claims some more resources and see, does it still fit? So now you have potentially hundreds of samples that you have to check in order to find out whether a task works. Now, factors of hundreds is noticeable even for us in terms of slowdown. So how could we do that more efficiently? We don't know yet. Good question. Here's another set of issues that come up. Um, so at the top of this picture, there's also got the springs, are some sort of, you can't see them very well, but there's long power distribution thing, the bus bars about the width of my hand, and they carry, they support about 500 machines at least. Those are connected to a thing called a PMDC, which is a two megawatt power distribution entity. So basically you have power is distributed in trees. 
when you start with the external one, you go to PNC that has bus bars coming out of it, those going down to the rack, power supplies, and so on, eventually get down to machines. Great. These things can fail. Individual machines can fail, a bus bar can fail, a PNC can fail, a site power can fail. Where should I place my tasks to minimize the likelihood that I have concurrent failures? Alternatively, asked a different way, how many extra tasks do I need to add to my job in order to make sure that I always have 400 of them? This turns out to be an interestingly hairy problem. And if you're interested, I can actually give you a formal problem spec for this thing. Um, powers and trees, it's relatively straightforward to see how to do until I tell you that the failure rate of these things aren't always the same. And I don't always put the same number of machines on each one, but you can sort of see roughly how you do that. Basically, you want to smear stuff across the bottom layer as much as you can. Of course, they lie to you. They aren't trees. Um, because you've got networks as well. And for various complicated reasons to do with stranded resources, your networks and your power distribution trees don't look quite the same. So they overlap in interesting ways. Um, we actually don't know how to solve this problem. The same question arises when the network goes away and you need access to stuff. We don't want to have that. I lie to you. They're not just as trees. Some of the power supplies provide redundant sources for things like the top of rack switches, so it's the generalized DAG. We have no clue. Um, so we just we approximate it today. We think we could do better if somebody was able to come in and do some sort of a better analysis of this. Uh, and it turns out you know, current failures are the thing that we really worry about a lot because if, if you have too, enough of them in one place, you have to drain that entire application running in that data center and all over something else, which makes us A, it's expensive and B, it's more vulnerable to other things going on. <coughs> There's an interesting problem if you're looking for some theory stuff. That would be a good place to go. Another thing, uh, the standard way of discovering whether something is wrong is by sort of pinging it. You know, are you there? Are you there? Are you healthy? Which is actually a completely different question. Let's not touch on that. <laughs> um, but surely we can do better, right? Suppose we know whether the switches are healthy or not. What we actually do, because we write the software for the switches, we build them ourselves. Suppose we know whether the power nodes are up or not. We don't write the software for them, but we ask them. Maybe we can correlate information from multiple sources to get a faster determination of an outage which means we can recover faster than we have less number of extra work workers required to keep up time to do it. Hmm. I haven't seen people do this. I've seen most people just use a single information for failure source protection. <coughs> can you do better? Remember the second thing that is detecting these things is running in, guess where, this environment. So it's subject to failures too. Turtle, all the way down. Okay, uh, it's probably the last major thing I want to talk about. Configuration. Configuration is saying, I want this to happen there. I've got my binary, I want my program, I've coded this, I've compiled it, I've managed to get it to link, and I want to tell the system how to run it. That's configuration. Everything you have to say to do that is configuration. This is probably our single biggest problem in terms of today. We have hundreds of thousands of configuration files. Probably more than that, but I can round it down. Um, and most of the time, sort of users feel like this about configuration. I tried to do the right thing. And that happened? Uh, uh, okay, so... Press the right to do better. So here's a, a trivial example. When Google Docs came in from the outside, we brought Google Docs up on the company we acquired. They managed to bring themselves up on our environment. To do that, they relied on about 50 different services. Cool. That was great. They could leverage all of those things. But they had to configure them. That was a small miracle. And then we said, that's nice. Thanks. Now we want to move you from one cell to another cell. Which parts of that configuration needs to be changed? How do you know? Somebody's saying, I'm using a big table. Is that because it's local scratch space? Or because that is the definitive source for that information? They have to use that big table. Or a replica. Which replica? Which one is the master? Where are the updates being done? What is the response time you need for getting access to that data? Is it more important to have fast access to the back end storage system or to your front end customers? All of those things you can imagine specifying as configuration. This is why it gets hard. So, this is an interesting test for can you, have you, do, have you understand the configuration dependence of the problem? Um, the answer is not yet. So, here's the kind of things that happen. This is from Matt Welsh, a colleague of mine. Um, they were running some job in the data center to have to do with uh, mobile phone uh, and data analytics. And it's not running out of file descriptors. It's kind of crashed all over the place. And they just released a new version. Obviously, they're stupid then. They rolled it back. It didn't help. 
what happened. Turned out, at the same time, somebody else updated a completely different system that they happened to depend on. <coughs> How do you find that? That's why configuration is really hard, to be able to extract the information that these two systems are related and are likely to have this effect if you do this thing to this one or that version of that. That is a problem we don't have a good answer for today. We would love to have you think about it. Let me give you an example of how this scales. So imagine you wanted to run, I don't know, a Google web search. So here's the box for Google web search. I'm lying to my TV form box, but it gives you a general idea. How many things do you have to set up descriptions for? Well, you have to talk to the job control system, which is the, the scheduling system I talked about earlier. So as an agent, you have to have the master, you have to have a description of your jobs and the number of tasks and how much memory they need, things like that. That's all enough. You need to put them somewhere. So they live in the source code control system, and they'll typically will clone a copy in Chubby so we can get access to the stuff. But that's not enough, because Chubby is not fast enough, so we have to have a front-end cache for it. Each of these boxes is itself a distributed system running on top of that cluster management system. Chubby doesn't work. Each of those boxes may need configuration specifications about how you want it to behave. Oh, the system itself needs configuring. So how do you tell the scheduler what properties it should be having and which priorities to give precedence to and things like that? Uh, we need to monitor stuff because otherwise it's going to be out of control. That monitoring system runs as the jobs inside the system, probably three or four of them for each of these target systems you're running. We'll actually run dedicated monitoring systems for those. Um, binaries, I mentioned those three gigabytes of Hello World. Well, how do you get the binaries to the machines? I've got uh, 2,000 machine GWIS tasks or jobs starting up. I want it to run now, not in six months. So I need to imagine sort of spanning trees for distributing that stuff. Imagine caching the original copy, which is probably being compiled somewhere in Oregon and we're running in Atlanta. That kind of stuff. Uh, security, yes, we like security. Good stuff, we need more of it, it's complicated. Uh, and we keep track of where all the resources went. Because otherwise, people are going to go crazy. You don't know. <coughs> so that was just to get Gwist to run. Now you want to do that again for another cell. Now you want to do that again for... Oh, I'm sorry, one more thing I should say. Um, the world is not static. So I just picked a random announcement of our the build system upgrade uh, for some month, May. And this is what the, 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 the new version announcement said. We've got a few fixes, we've added a few features, and we've broken some things in incompatible ways. <laughs> Each of those boxes is doing this. So basically we basically have to run hard to stay still. And then we want to restructure stuff, because those new features are worth taking advantage of sometimes. You know, have to rebuild things and make changes. And it will depend on you too, so if you have to problem, this will propagate up the stack. And of course I like, it isn't just one user, it's a few people, a few tens of thousands of people, or writing software that fits in the system or have to handle it. So surely there's a better way. We'd like to be like that trike or like that bike rather than like this stuff, right? It turns out we've built systems that for people like Gwis, which you know, one of the there are about five uh, applications, web search is one of them, which use some of that 80% of our resources. Those five applications, it's worth having a dedicated full-time set of people worrying about how to make them more efficient. One percent efficiency improvement for web search is a big deal. But the other 20,000 developers are writing software where it doesn't matter if we're a factor of two inefficient, you not even tell. So those people, unfortunately, are exposed to the systems that can support Gwis. When I last looked, there were 230 configuration logs for our job control system. And they're just listed in order, alphabetical order. You have to understand which of them apply to you. The answer is almost none of them. <laughs> but you have to wade your way to 230 of them to discover that. So what do people do? They find somebody else's description that works, and they add things to it until it stops complaining. <laughs> and then their friends do the same thing. <coughs> you can see where this goes. Okay, so we'd love to automate a whole pile of stuff. The goal we currently, the mantra is, here's my binary running. I don't want to tell you how much memory it uses. What would you, how would I work out how much memory it uses? I would run it, and I would measure it, and I would run it again because it fell over, because it ran out. Well, why can't you do that for me? So we have systems that do. But here's an example of the problems you get. This is, uh, the x-axis is offered load to some random web system, I can't actually remember right now. And the y-axis is how many resources a particular type of use. The uh, red dots are memory usage, and the blue dots are CPU usage. 
Could we model that, please? <laughs> because I'm going to automate the system around me. This is the real world. This is why this stuff is hard. If it was a nice, simple, straight line, this would be trivial. That produces close to a nice, simple, straight line. I like it. It has all sorts of complications. But, but this is the kind of thing that makes automation fun. Um, so here's my brain running. How many copies should I make? Where should I put them? What happens when that data center fills up? Which data storage system does it need to be close to? I don't want to tell you any of those things. I just want to say, here's my binary running. So we're trying to build a system to automate the answer to all of those other questions. As you can imagine, with that configuration set up behind the scenes, it's interesting. Uh, but suppose we succeed for the moment, and we manage to get, we actually have a, a, a test system internal called Pondo, which does some, many of these things. Um, and we will automatically generate things like uh, sizes and stuff like that. That, that part's actually pretty easy. We can look at historical data and uh, just measure stuff. Remember, things can fail, so we give it some memory. If it runs, great. If it doesn't run, it falls over, give it more memory, repeat. Because it's used to fail. That gives us some advantages. But here's something that's really hard. It didn't do what I wanted. Why not? I want you, system, to explain to me, person, in terms of I understand, not that you understand, why this happened. <coughs> an internal waiting list of people who are basically continuously asking why isn't job X running on cluster Y? Because the me mechanism gave them back data they just don't understand. We need to fix this problem. It's like finding ways to, so you don't have to understand the innards of the system to be able to work out what you should do about it. The question is not really why didn't it run. The question is really what should I do differently to make it run that I can afford in a timely fashion without too much work. And here's where it really matters. We have a group of people who are incredibly bright system administrators. Uh, we call them SRE, Cyber Reliability Engineers. Uh, they have a couple of properties. They think of them as sort of operators with PhDs, sort of that caliber of folk. They understand how to run these systems, and they love whiskey. <laughs> so it's traditional to page these people at 3 in the morning. Because otherwise, you know, what the heck, what's the point? Um, remember, they have 15 minutes to respond. So the first five is finding the coffee, the second five is ingesting the coffee, the last five is working out how to answer these questions. <laughs> is it actually going pear-shaped, or is it just a false alarm? The system has paged them because it doesn't know. So the system is confused. It's gone beyond the automated limits, and it's now, well, oh, I've all this data good. So how do you present information to them in a way that allows them to say, I'll be in trouble. I'll be back to get into trouble, or should I just go back to sleep and yell at somebody in the morning? <coughs> because it should not have worked in the office as harmless. Yes. There are actually several tens of headlines to not just a few. And what really what they would like to have is advice. Often the system knows what it should do, but it doesn't feel it has the authority to do it. Are you willing for the system to spend a few million dollars <coughs> on your decision, or do you want a person in that way? You probably want a person in that way. We'd like to be able to have the system tell you two things. One is, I think you should do this, and here's why I think you should do this, and here's how much I believe you should do this. So you could make informed decisions rather than just press the yeah, no, no. Because sometimes it's wrong. You just don't know how to build a system capable of coping with everything going on simultaneously. Okay, great. So that's basically it. Uh, I hope I've managed to get across the idea that this is an interesting area. It's one of many, right? We have lots of people doing other fun things inside Google. They just happen to work in one of these. Um, scale is fun, but scale itself is not interesting. It's what it causes that's interesting. <coughs> Good questions from the point of view of a researcher. I like to think of myself as that. A lot of what I've been describing is really about how you deliver predictable quality of service to your users in a world where the mechanisms don't provide the quality of service directly, they only help you get there in an interesting way. So how do you bridge that gap? How do you make those things repeatable and cost-effective? Um, and maybe configuration is an interesting topic area for looking for something to start working in. I have to do this. Uh, <laughs> Come, uh, And feel free to email me if you want to chat about all these things or grab me afterwards. Thanks.